Uh, good evening and welcome to the seventh Judge Guido Calabresi Fellowship in Religion and Law. As I welcome all of you who are here, I also welcome those watching at home via our website or Facebook page. I express my gratitude to the Lehrman Institute for their generosity in making this event possible. Uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, Lou Lehrman could not be here tonight, but he sends his warmest regards. It is personally encouraging for me to see so many alumni uh, interested and deeply committed to expanding the program that serves Catholic life on campus. I'm grateful to Lou Lehrman and to Guido Calabresi for all they have done and continue to do uh, in this chapel. It is a pleasure to introduce our guests tonight, Judge Marta Cartabia and Professor Marianne Glendon. Judge Cartabia is a member of the Constitutional Court of Italy, appointed by President Giorgio Napolitano in 2011, and the only woman among the members of the Consulta. She's a professor of constitutional law at the University of Milan, where she has taught the Jean Monnet course in European constitutional law since 2005. She received her PhD, PhD in law from the European University Institute in Florence. Professor Glendon, our respondent, was our very first Calabresi Fellow in 2003, and it's a, a delight to welcome her back to the chapel. She is the Learned Hand Professor of Law at Harvard University. She is the first female president of the Pontifical Academy of Social Sciences and is the former U.S. Ambassador to the Holy See. She writes and teaches in the fields of human rights, comparative law, constitutional law, and political theory. She holds bachelor's, master's, and doctoral degrees from the University of Chicago. We are honored by the presence of these two outstanding women tonight. After Judge Cartabia's remarks and Professor Glendon's response, as I ask the first question, I invite you to write a question on the index card found at your chair. I ask, ask that you pass those questions to the aisle and it will be collected. And the question period will be moderated by Christian Brissett, a law school student and member of this community. Please join me in welcoming Judge Cartabia for her lecture, A Journey with Pope Benedict XVI Through the Spirit of Constitutionalism. Judge Cartabia. Good evening, everybody. Uh, first and foremost, uh, a wholehearted thank to the Thomas More Institute uh, for inviting me uh, to give this uh, Guido Calabresi lecture to Father Beloin, uh, to Jamie Capetta, who made everything happen and arranged everything for me, and uh, especially to Guido Calabresi and uh, his wife, uh, because it's a really honor for me to have my name associated in some way to this uh, uh, the name of these distinguished scholars. But tonight, I have an additional reason for gratitude since uh, I'm sharing this forum with Marianne Glendon, who has played and still plays such an inspiring role in my personal and professional life as a woman, as a legal scholar, a true witness in the academy as well as in the public arena. So the topic of this lecture tonight uh, uh, is about Pope Benedict legal thinking. Quite an imaginative topic, you, can, you might think. But I chose this topic since uh, I've always been struck by the sensitivity of Pope Benedict to the problem of law and justice. And in particular, I would like to recall uh, a, a little experience of mine, because a few weeks uh, after my appointment uh, uh, as a judge at the Italian Constitutional Court, uh, Pope Benedict pronounced uh, probably the most famous uh, speech uh, on these topics, uh, the Bundestag, the German uh, mm, parliament. And at the beginning of that address, Pope Benedict uh, evoke uh, uh, a powerful, very suggestive story from the Bible. Uh, you have quotations uh, on this uh, sheet which might help a little bit uh, so that you can follow better and uh, help my bad pronunciation for which I apologize uh, in advance. And uh, this is the first quotation. In this story, he recalls the story of King Solomon 
and he says, God invited the young King Solomon on his accession to the throne to make a request. What will the young ruler ask for at this important moment? Success, wealth, long life, destruction of his, his enemies. He chooses none of these thing, things and instead he asks for a listening heart so that he might govern God's people and discern between good and evil. Well, this idea of a listening heart, uh, and we will see later, is uh, almost equal to a broad and open reason in order to distinguish, to discern good and evil, accompanies me ever since uh, in my day in the courtroom because my desire is to perform my duty with this open and listening heart uh, to the duty and to the truth. And so that's why I decided later to reflect attentively on his legal thinking. I propose this topic to for tonight. Little did I know that our reflections tonight would take place uh, after the transition from Pope Benedict to Pope Francis. <laughs> anyway, I think that it is an additional reason to reflect on his contribution uh, to the public debate. Well, as a matter of fact, Pope Benedict is not uh, a legal scholar, and uh, I suppose never meant to be. Probably it sounds very strange to him if we say that we are speaking uh, of his thought as a legal scholar. But uh, as a pope, uh, he was invited a number of times to enter into dialogue uh, with political and cultural leaders in Europe and elsewhere in the world. So a number of legal speeches sprang out of these interactions with politicians, lawyers, academics. Uh, and in these speeches, uh, he showed a deep concern uh, for the legal and political dilemmas of contemporary democracies. And he took an unexpected approach, one that might be of great interest and importance to believers and non-believers alike. So my starting point for mm, tonight, uh, for our journey with Pope Benedict XVI through the spirit of constitutionalism will be a very basic and simple question. Let's ask ourselves, what do we think uh, is the contribution of the Catholic tradition to the contemporary legal debate? Or to put it in a different way, what in substance does the Catholic culture teach us about public life, in particular about law and politics? It is tempting to ask somebody here in the audience, <laughs> but I resist. But uh, once again, let's pause for a moment, uh, each of us. Uh, what are the first answers that come to mind? I think that whether Catholic or not, uh, our first thought are for life, family, abortion, euthanasia, marriage, and maybe solidarity and subsidiarity for those who know a little bit about the social doctrine of uh, the, the Catholic doctrine of uh, social life. So we think, usually we think uh, of the non-negotiable values of Catholic morality and the main principles of Catholic social doctrine, isn't it? Moreover, I think that most people consider those values uh, as dogmas, uh, indisputable commandments uh, deriving from the pronouncements uh, of the authority of the church, the pope, the bishops, uh, and the like. And to be sure, of course, the Catholic Church is very committed to family, life, uh, social needs. So we might expect uh, that Pope Benedict uh, would dedicate uh, the, the time, the opportunity to talk to these politicians in Europe uh, to unfolding these topics uh, 
and to emphasizing the importance of those values for social life. After all, he could have taken advantage of the opportunity of being invited at Westminster, the Bundestag, in Paris, at the United Nations, uh, to take a stance in favor of those moral values. He didn't, not a word about those values. We might be surprised to realize that Pope Benedict's interest in law and politics is much more fundamental than that. He does not uh, um, propose specific responses responses to the most relevant and debated problems. He is much more concerned with the method than with the outcome. But let's go through the speeches. The core of Pope Benedict XVI's position is expressed in one of the central sentences of the speech at the Bundestag. You find it in the second quotation. Let's read it together. In history, systems of law have almost always been based on religion. Decisions regarding what was to be lawful among men were taken with reference to the divinity. Unlike other great religions, Christianity has never proposed a revealed law to the state and to society. That is to say, a juridical order derived from revelation. Instead, it has pointed to nature and reason as the true sources of law, and to the harmony of objective and subjective reason, which naturally presupposes that both spheres are rooted in the creative reason of God. In other words, we do not need to recognize, uh, how do we need to recognize uh, what is just and, and, and what is the right and just law? We do not really need revelation for this purpose, nor we do need dogma of faith. We need instead reason and nature in their interconnections, legal problems, fall in the domain of reason, they do not pertain to the content of revelation. And in a previous speech at Westminster Hall, you find the quotation number three, he has framed the same concept as follow. The Catholic tradition maintains that the objective norms governing right action are accessible to reason independently from the content of revelation. According to this understanding, the role of religion in political debate is not so much to supply these norms as if they could not be known by non-believers, still less to propose concrete political solutions. We would lie altogether outside the competence of religion. These statements uh, are so neat and clear that could hardly be misunderstood. Benedict XVI overturns the assumption that the contribution of Christianity to the public debates derives from the command of an authority, ipse dixit. In political and legal disputes, he does not rely on the statements of the religious authority but on the authority of reason. He demands that Catholic people engage in a thorough use of reason. He does not allow them to deprive themselves of the beauty and the appeal of using their own reason, nor does he permit them to hide behind the authority of the church or of the commandments or of religious precepts. He requires Christians to take part in the democratic dialogos using arguments open to everybody, believers and non-believers, re reason and nature in their interconnection. This is a very important point that sheds new light on the debate on religion and public reason. 
Somebody said that this speech at the Bundestag is the reply to John Rawls. And uh, it is not exaggeration to say that Western culture in both side, on both sides of the Atlantic uh, has been deeply influenced by John Rawls uh, and his followers, uh, especially the first version of the, his theories, uh, when he says that in a liberal, pluralistic society, all comprehensive doctrines, and in particular, all religious doctrines, must be kept at the margin of public debate. Later, Rawls uh, upheld a more nuanced position on this point, but his original idea uh, that became the basic framework of liberal political system was that uh, religion should be enclosed in the private domain. This exclusion of religion from public de de debate uh, is based on the assumption that uh, religious precepts uh, cannot be introduced in the public debate because they are re uh, discussion stopper. They are not open to discussion and so they are not good for democracy. And this is a serious argument. That's why it's so important that Pope Benedict's uh, when he speaks to politicians, says that for Christians, legal and political issues are not a matter of revelation, but a matter of reason. The contribution of Christians to the public debate should be positioned, fashioned out of reason, accessible to everybody, and can be discussed with everybody. This idea relates uh, to his conception of politics and history. In uh, another work of his, it was uh, a previous work, you can find it in the fourth quotation, he says, history is, so to speak, the kingdom of reason. Politics does not establish the kingdom of God, but he certainly ought to be concerned about the just kingdom of man. And again, politics is the sphere of reason. Benedict XVI's legal thinking is free of all epistemic discrepancy between reason and faith, or between knowing and believing. And thanks to this unity, of mind, he offer a simple and persuasive answer to one of the most complex problems of our liberal and pluralistic democracy when he invites Christians to participate in public and political life on the basis of what they share with their fellow citizens, that is, reason and nature. This understanding of the presence of Christians in the forum to bring, uh, to borrow uh, a very nice expression from Marianne's most recent book, The Tower and the Forum, is worth reading, uh, is, uh, brings us to an unexpected outcome. Here, really fasten your seatbelts because I'm stating something very shocking. Benedict XVI express a clear endorsement of democracy and even to a certain degree of relativistic culture in political life. Yes, of a relativistic culture in political life. Democracy and relativistic culture are strictly connected as Kelsen has put it uh, since uh, the origin, since uh, his uh, writings uh, in the 40s, uh, it is clear, and you have the quotation on your, your sheet, that uh, relativism is the Weltanschauung that the democratic idea presumes, or democracy is political relativism. And Joseph Ratzinger, as theologian, as perfect for the congregation of the doctrine of faith and as a pope, is famous because he's firmly opposed the culture of relativism in a number of his statements. And in fact, his reputation is strictly linked to his stance against relativism. 
So, how is that uh, he might endorse democracy as a suitable political model and even praise a certain degree of relativism in legal and political affairs. Let's read his word. He said in, in the Bundestag speech, for most of the matters that need to be regulated by law, the support of the majority can serve, serve as a sufficient criterion. We can trust the support of the majority decision. Respect for democracy was also expressed in the, in the speech to the Westminster Hall. And so we can clearly understand that Pope Benedict appreciates democratic procedure on the, based on the majority principles and on the idea of the consensus, which after all implies some relativistic culture. At first sight, this is a little bit baffling. But as a matter of fact, his teaching on the nature of polity in the modern world has two tenets. First, given that legal order pertains to human affairs and it is not the domain of the absolute, he supports a healthy democratic relativism as an ordinary method of government within the temporal context. This is realism. Second, he warns against the risk that this democratic relativism might itself become in turn an absolute, a kind of paradoxical absolute relativism that exposes people to the unlimited and uncontrolled power of the majority. So, he endorsed democracy and the relativistic culture insofar as they do not become an absolute themselves. He says in another speech that majority too can be blind or unjust, as history teaches us very plainly. The doctrine of legal positivism and legal relativism, and he discussed Kelsen on this point, are unacceptable in his point of view insofar as, quote, truth is replaced by the decision of the majority, so that the chance occurrence of a majority becomes an absolute. That is why uh, his teaching as a second pillar Although the majority rule is the ordinary method of government, yet, I quote, it is evident that for the fundamental issues of law in which the dignity of man and of humanity is at stake, the majority principle is not enough. Everyone in a position of responsibility must personally seek out the criteria to be followed when framing laws or judging cases, we can add. In a beautiful passage, Cardinal Ratzinger had already summarized his thinking and as follows. You can find it uh, at quotation number seven. This is a really a beautiful quotation that is worth reading uh, carefully. A free society is said to be a relativistic society. Only on this condition can it remain free and open-ended. In the realm of politics, this view is to great extent true. The one single correct political option does not exist. Thinking that it could be was precisely the error of Marxism and of political theology, theologies. Even in the realm of politics, of course, one cannot always manage with absolute relativism. There are things that are wrong and can never become right, 
killing in innocent people, for instance, denying individuals the right to be treated as human and a way of life appropriate to death. And there are things that are right and can never become wrong. Here maybe a biographical note can, may help explain in this sensitivity of Pope Benedict XVI and his distrust toward the tyranny of majority. He grew up, after all, in Germany under the Nazi regime and both as a person and as a German, he suffered the consequences of that regime which assumed power with the support of the majority. And in fact, what troubles about the European Nazi and fascist re regime is that in those time, not only were atrocious acts committed, racial persecution and all the rest that everybody knows, but those acts were imposed by legislation, approved by the parliaments. Suffice here to recall the Nuremberg laws of 1935 and likewise the racial laws in Italy of 1938. The Shoah was a legal injustice, as Gustav Radbrook says. Example of legal injustice can be found in the history of all countries. And in the face of these atrocities, uh, the new wave of constitution reacted, uh, approving a number of new charters of rights, new constitutional, new constitution, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the European Convention. We wanted to secure our rights against the floating majorities. New and higher principles were added to the legal system in order to set up intangible limit to legislation. In this respect, there is a harmony of thinking between Pope Benedict XVI and the spirit of constitutionalism. Because Benedict XVI too claims a sort of bipolarity that must be preserved by the rule of the majority on the one hand, and the protection of certain fundamental principles of justice, principles that might be shielded against the unpredictable outcomes of the sometimes fickle game of democracy. So far, there is a sort of correspondence of the Benedict XVI legal thinking and the spirit of constitutionalism. But these similarities go hand in hand with some important differences that I would like here to point out. And in order to understand uh, the following step, I would like to recall another important speech of Pope Benedict XVI at the United Nations. I think that Marianne was there when he was uh, addressing uh, the Assembly of the United Nations in New York in 2008. And uh, it, it is a very important uh, the speech in which uh, he praises a lot uh, the contribution that uh, the Universal Declaration has given uh, to the common good of the human family. And nevertheless, uh, as Marianne has pointed out in one of her articles, in that speech, uh, the expression of appreciation of Pope Benedict towards the Universal Declaration of Human Rights are accompanied by a set of warnings, as she says. And she singles out uh, no less than nine points. I will limit myself here to one point, and uh, it is about uh, his critique to legal positivism. Quotation number eight. Experience shows that legality often prevails over justice, legality and justice, when the insistence upon rights makes them appear as the exclusive result of legislative enactments of, or normative decisions taken by the various agencies of those in power. When presented purely in terms of legality, rights risk becoming weak proposition 
divorced from the ethical and national dimension which is their foundation and their goal. In other words, new charter of rights and declaration might be extremely important and actually have been in history extremely important for the protection of human freedom, dignity, but they cannot do the whole job. Paradoxical as it may sound, the mere setting of human rights and principle of justice into worded text does not suffice. They remain goal to be attained even though they may be fixed in law. Let's take an example for the history of this wonderful, beautiful country. In the Declaration of Independence, 1776, had already been clearly affirmed that it is a self-evident truth that all men were created equal. And yet, the subsequent story of the USA showed that a civil war was necessary, a constitutional amendment, a president was assassinated, and yet all this was not enough to combat slavery and racial discrimination. So the world were there since the origin, but it was not necessary, not enough, sorry. The spirit of constitutionalism is to create a set of legal limits to power in order to prevent the state from becoming a band of robbers, as St. Augustine says, magna latrocinia. To this end, constitution, uh, international documents are very useful. And constitutionalism, to be clear, is a great achievement uh, in the history of humanity. However, we have to learn something more from Benedict XVI because his teaching goes farther. It's not an opposition, but it goes farther. He warns that even constitutional and international documents are not enough because new facts, new social challenges, new technology uh, ask for new interpretation and new reaction and they are the crack through which the tyranny of the majority might threaten hum human dignity and human li life despite the proclamation of rights. So, mm, the, the teaching of Benedict XVI on this point is that striving against injustice is always a dynamic task, an ongoing and endless drama. And in this never-ending, inexhaustible struggle against in injustice, the protagonist cannot be a text of principles or a set of moral principles. It is rather a living person, a subject. It is each of us. No legal system, even the most perfect, can do without the tireless energy of each human person that springs from human longing for justice. Even if previous generation gives us beautiful documents, the Universal Declaration, our wonderful Constitution, we should, star should start again and do our job because otherwise those values will vanish. And this is a very important point in his teaching and we can find the wonderful words in the Spe Salvi. It is the quotation number nine. The kingdom of good will never be definitively established in this world. Anyone who promises a better world that is guaranteed to last forever is making a false promise. He is overlooking human freedom. If there were structures which could irrevocably guarantee a determinate good, state of the world, man's freedom would be denied 
and hence they would not be good at all. Each generation has the task of engaging anew in the arduous search for the right way to order human affairs. This task is never simply completed. In other words, good structures help, but of themselves they are not enough. <coughs> Men, he says, can be never redeemed simply from outside. So you see, this pope was described by the media as a conservative pope in a way from the legal point of view at least. But in fact, Benedict XVI is a great reformer. He said that each generation has to find a new, their own way to, toward justice, calling for each citizen to use his or her critical reason and his conscience to question the positive rules so that the law in force is not allowed to become unlawful or to be unlawfully applied. He knows very well that no matter how perfect is a set of rule, it is always exposed to become the most perfect injustice. As the Roman law says, summum ius summa inuria. And all the humanist tradition tell us that we need the conscience of the individual. Like, for example, in the famous Sophocles tragedy, Antigone, who exposed herself to the sacrifice of her life to oppose the unjust law by Creonte. Or in a lighter way, maybe you are familiar with the comedy of Shakespeare, The Merchant of Venice, in which Portia dress up uh, as a lawyer and elaborate a, a subtle interpretation of the law in order to save Antonio for unjust death because uh, of uh, the outstanding debts that he had to pay, he was not able to pay. There are different figures, tragedy and a comedy, but uh, you know, all the humanistic tradition always says us that there can be uh, law and positive laws that need to be reformed by the conscience of the individual. This brings us back uh, to our first point, uh, our first quotation from the Bundestag, not a revelation, but reason and nature in their interconnection. Because in this way we can see how much importance Benedict XVI attaches to human reason and to the human capacity of being critic against the positive law. So here a new question may arise. Is Pope Benedict XVI advocating a sort of new enlightenment or the Kantian sapere aude or maybe is not aware of the is out problem, the natural fallacy of David Hume. In order to answer this question, other questions should be posed. What kind of reason is speaking about Pope Benedict XVI? Is it the reason of the Enlightenment? What kind of nature, what kind of reason allows the individual not to be trapped into his subjectivism, because this advocation of conscience can be, you know, become a sort of new subjectivism, a new relativism. Well, his trust in human reason goes hand in hand with a call for reconsidering our idea of reason. In his understanding, reason cannot be reduced to positivistic or scientific intelligence. Scientific approach is but one of the possibility of human reason, but reason in his understanding is much more than logic or pragmatic verification of data or technological rationality. In fact, in, this, in, the, in, in, in the 
in the Bundestag speech, uh, he speaks uh, with a beautiful image of uh, the kind of reason, reason he's thinking about. Uh, and he uses a, a wonderful uh, image that has been uh, in my mind is, is in, with, together with the idea of the listening art, uh, which is a good comp complement to it. Let's go to quotation number 11. Um, in its self-proclaiming exclusivity, the positivistic reason which recognized nothing beyond mere functionality resembled to a concrete bunker with no windows, in which we, ourselves, provide lighting and atmospheric condition being no longer willing to obtain either from God's wide world. The windows must be flung open again. We must see the wide world, the sky and the earth once more, and learn to make proper use, uses of all of this. So he is not endorsing the Enlightenment but uh, he is not even dismissing the Enlightenment and its outcome. Rather, he suggests to mend, to refine the idea of reason, the idea of modern reason, in order to embrace uh, its original capacity, to open the windows of our reason in order to see again the nature and the world. And to explain this point, Pope Benedict XVI gives a fabulous example that quite one could never expect from him. He speaks uh, about uh, um, the importance of the ecological movement in Germany. Of course, <laughs> this is very unexpected because in all of these speeches you have no concrete examples as I mentioned at, at the beginning, it does not speak about life, family, and whatever. The only example it chooses uh, is about the ecological movement, the Greens. And he says uh, that uh, it is important because those people, uh, although they, he says that they, they not exactly flung open, flung open again the windows, nevertheless, uh, their movement was a, and continues to be a cry for, for fresh air, which might not be, must not be ignored or pushed aside, just because it is too much to see or, or they seem irrational. He says that it is important because they stress the fact that the earth has a dignity of its own and that we must follow his directives. And uh, then he goes on, you have the full quotation here at number 12. He adds, this importance of the ecological movement suggests us that we have an ecology of nature to respect and we also have an ecology of man to pay attention to. So, he suggests the way in which this reason can be open again, listening the language of nature to the ecology of nature, the ecology of man. With these examples, Benedict XVI explains how the source of law can be found in reason and nature and their interrelation. The redefining of modern reason that Pope Benedict suggests consists in restoring a proper relationship between reason and reality. A, a self-sufficient reason cannot pull itself uh, out of the slough from taking his own air like the Baron of Munchausen. But this is the problem of the modern reasons because since Descartes, Western culture has been focused only on the individual and uh, his uh, subjective reasons, his, his subjective capacity, cogito ergo sum, and is therefore trapped by the limit of subjective reason. Since then, our culture has been blind to the fact that 
knowledge require a dialogue between a subject, reason, and a reality, nature. And both of these two elements uh, should be preserved. Re reality exceeds uh, what subjective reason can understand, but on the other hand, reality can only be understood when it affects an individual. Reason and nature, subject and reality. In the dynamism of human experience, new aspects of reality, natural data, scientific evidence, historical events, personal relationship, constantly affect the human mind and provoke it to open up to new possibilities, unpredictable events that affect us and stir our interest and curiosity prompt us to open the windows of our mind and to see more. Reality is the fundamental ally of reason. Unexpected facts and encounters impact, disturb, trouble, and sometimes shock our personal experience, but this is all the only way we have to prompt human reason to open up so that its greatness may be restored. It is an ongoing dynamism. So we arrive at our final step, just a few minutes. And we are ready to address uh, the pivotal point of Pope Benedict's teaching. And uh, I refer here to the connection between reason and faith uh, that has always been one of the central points of Pope Benedict's teaching as a theologian and also in all these speeches, in particular in the Regensburg speech. As a cardinal, he has already stated that one of the import most important practical function of faith is to offer healing for the reason as reason, to bring it to itself again. Faith as a historical instrument can set reason itself free again, so that reason can once more see properly for itself. Without faith, philosophy cannot be whole, but faith without reason cannot be human. This is one of the most important uh, passages of his uh, uh, understanding of the relationship between faith and reason. And so, how can we explain this strange connection? On the one hand, we have this great importance attached to reason and to his openness uh, towards reality. And then on the other hand, uh, a new elements come into the discussion. He says that we need faith. So how come that we do not, do not need to rely on revelation, but instead on reason? And then he said that reason cannot be reason without the help and the purification of faith. Here, I, of course, this uh, relationship between faith and reason is the topic for another conference and with another speaker that is not the, our, we don't have ne neither the time nor the capacity to do this. But I would like, as a final point, uh, to recall uh, the understanding that Pope Benedict XVI has of faith, because here we can understand that there is no discrepancy between reality and faith. Because uh, in the Deus Caritas Est, first point, he said that being Christian is not the result of an ethical choice or of a lofty idea, but it is the encounter with an event, a person which gives life a new horizon and a decisive direction. Christian faith uh, does not pertain to the province of sentiments uh, or irrationality. Faith is not a sort of superstition, nor does it belong just uh, to the ethical sphere. It is not just a set of moral values. Faith is part of reality and history. 
because he says that it originates in the encounter with an event. So, among all other natural and historical data, one fact creeps as a privileged lie of reason, the encounter with a new human experience regenerated by faith. Here, it could be very interesting, but we don't have the time to read the wonderful speech at the College of Bernardin, in which uh, he described in a very poetic way how Europe uh, was regenerated around the monasteries in the Middle Age after the devastation of uh, the, the barbaric devastation. I don't have the time to, to pause on this uh, speech because you have been so patient with me. But uh, uh, thanks to this story, really we can understand uh, how can Pope Benedict XVI says that on the one hand, we do not need to enter the public debate or to deal with our problem of the foundation of law and to our need and our longing for justice appealing to a revelation. We can and we must rely on reason, but he corrects this reason and he says that faith is useful to us to deal, as, to deal with our legal and political problem because faith is the fact, an event, a series of encounters that open our reason and our mind. Religion, in, in this sense, we can conclude and say with him that religion in this perspective is not a problem for legislators to solve, but a vital contributor to national public debate. I will stop here and thank you so much for your patience. What a wonderful tour through the thought of Benedict the 16th and I wonder if you had the same reaction that I did that at practically every milestone uh, in this journey we encounter a Benedict XVI who is deeply at variance with the popular stereotype of Joseph Ratzinger that we get in the media. Uh, it's such a joy to be here tonight. It's such a pleasure to be back again at the Calabrese Lecture and such a pleasure and an honor to comment on the work of one of the finest constitutional scholars I have known. As uh, Judge Cartabia mentioned when she was invited to give this talk and when this event was planned, she never imagined that we would be discussing the work of a Pope Emeritus. In fact, she probably never imagined that there would be such a thing as a Pope Emeritus. <laughs> uh, but here we are. And uh, since we are here at the end of a pontificate, it is difficult to think of these writings uh, by Pope Benedict except uh, in relation to a kind of legacy. And uh, in, from that perspective, I can only applaud the choice of these legal political writings for tonight's lecture because I will go so far as to predict that it is these writings that will probably be the best remembered and the most widely appreciated of the writings of this very scholarly and prolific pope. I'm not saying that they are the best writings. I'm saying it's more like the 10 top hits of Benedict the 16th. And very often it is these short writings for a popular audience where a scholar or a, a political figure distills a life's work into readily accessible language. Though that's, that's what we remember. Uh, so, um, Judge Cartabia has given us a deeply insightful reading of these speeches, and she discerns within them a distinctive approach to legal and constitutional problems. I was thinking, what if Benedict himself could hear 
this talk where she uh, constructs him as a legal theorist. And I was thinking he'd probably have a reaction something like Moliere's gentleman when he found out he was speaking prose. You can imagine Benedict saying, ah, I never knew. Ich bin ein Rechtdenker. So uh, since we are, in a way, engaged in a kind of retrospective exercise, I would like to offer as my contribution to this discussion just four brief observations on the relationship of these legal, political, relatively popular writings to what probably is the most salient theme of his papacy and of his work as a, polit uh, as a, as a theologian, and that is his emphatic defense of reason. His defense of reason against the forces of irrationality unleashed by religions that have rejected the good gifts of the Enlightenment on the one hand, and his defense of reason against the forces unleashed by 19th century nihilism, which has trickled down to popular uh, God is dead, have a nice day, uh, that kind of uh, relativism on the other hand. So first observation, the legal theory that uh, Judge Cartabia has discerned in Benedict's speeches is, of course, rooted in his lifelong fascination with the synergy between faith and reason. From his very early works to the present time, he's vigorously expressed his appreciation for the positive aspects of modernity while developing a trenchant critique of an impoverished concept of reason that is limited to the empirically verifiable. No one should have been surprised, therefore, to hear a pope speak so fulsomely in praise of the Enlightenment as Benedict did at Regensburg, or as he did a few months later when he said this, it is necessary to welcome the real achievements of Enlightenment thinking, human rights, and especially the freedom of faith and its exercise, recognizing these as elements that are also essential for the authenticity of religion. No one should have been surprised, but many were. At the same time, Benedict has always been careful to point out what many secular thinkers have forgotten about the Enlightenment, namely its enormous debt to Christianity. It was a real loss, Benedict argues, when they consciously severed their roots, their own roots, in Christian thinking. In his legal and political speeches, he repeatedly insisted that just as the sons and daughters of the Enlightenment would benefit from overcoming or outgrowing their hostility to religion, he has insisted that religion benefits from embracing reason in its fullness. That, of course, was the message that got lost in the brouhaha over Regensburg. Now, my second observation concerns Benedict's understanding of reason, because as Judge Cartabia has explained, what he means from reason does need to be discussed. It's certainly not Thomas Hobbes's concept of reason as an instrument in the service of the desires, although you've got to love Thomas Hobbes. The thoughts are but scouts and spies seeking out the objects, aiding the objects of the desires. Even if you disagree with him, he really was quite a Quite a writer. Anyway, certainly not more, uh, not mere scientific calculation. What is his concept of reason? A more capacious concept that seeks to overcome the dichotomy between reason confined to the experimental sphere and faith confined to the spiritual domain. As he put it in the Collège des Berlandins, an attitude which seeks to drive the question of God into the subjective realm as being unscientific would be the capitulation of reason, the renunciation of its highest possibilities, and hence a disaster for humanity. My third observation concerns the dissonance that uh, Judge Cartabia already noted between the mind of Benedict that we encounter in his writings and the popular stereotype of Cardinal Ratzinger as some kind of uh, fundamentalist fanatic. There are so many other surprises that one could point to. The emeritus pope's enthusiasm for the best of secular thought is but one indication of how far 
that stereotype is from reality. Another indication, I commend to you in his introduction to Christianity, his remarkable reflections on doubt. Doubt, he says, is the plane upon which the believer and the unbeliever can meet. And he, of course, acted on that in his very public dialogues with Jürgen Habermas and again in his co-authoring of a book with a prominent Italian agnostic, Marcello Pera. Although Mar I think Marcello Pera is losing his agnostic faith. I think probably he's on the verge of becoming something Christian. But, um, <laughs> you know, I, I, just, I mean, this, I think you, you could have titled this lecture The Surprising Pope when he organized a meeting, an interfaith meeting at Assisi in the tradition of John Paul II, he gave instructions, be sure to invite agnostics because they are searchers too. Well, I give one more example, and that is his bold appropriation of the word secularism, which is anathema to many conservative Catholic thinkers, but every time he had a chance in these political speeches and political venues, he took it to advance a concept that he calls positive secularism, which affirms the necessity of keeping religion out of government and government out of religion, but says that doesn't mean that you keep religious points of view out of political discourse, you don't keep religious people out of the public square, and above all, Secularism does not have to entail hostility to religion. And that brings me to my fourth and final observation, which is really a question. What is it that we lay men and women are supposed to take away from those speeches where Benedict placed such emphasis on faith and reason in relation to legal and political topics? So it's a black letter theology, so to speak, that uh, when the church leaders speak on political or legal subjects, they do not offer specific programs and policies. They speak at the level of principle, they offer guidelines, and it is up to the laity to bring those principles and guidelines to life in the places where they live and work. When Benedict speaks of entering public debate on the basis of reasons that are accessible to believers and non-believers alike, and using our conscience as well as our critical reason, he's certainly, he's certainly challenging the faithful. He's certainly issuing a challenge to the laity. Now, of course, it's the same challenge that church leaders have been issuing repeatedly and with extreme urgency ever since Vatican II. Uh, John Paul II used to speak of his letters to the laity and the laity as a sleeping giant, wondering if anybody ever read them. And one often does wonder whether anyone is listening to these exhortations. But occasionally, there is evidence that someone has heard those exhortations to bring faith and reason into one's public life. And there's evidence occasionally that someone has taken them to heart. Consider, for example, these lines written by one of America's greatest judges on the subject, the very difficult subject, of how a decision maker should think about a situation where he or she knows that the losing side is going to be gravely disappointed. Here's what this judge said. A decision which recognizes the values on the losing side as real and significant tends to keep us from becoming callous with respect to the beliefs that lose out. This gives the losers hope that the values they cherish will not ultimately be abandoned by the society and that the society despite what it chooses to do now, will not become immoral in the long run. It tells the losers that although they lost, they and their values do carry weight and are recognized in our society even when they don't win out. In other words, it treats them as citizens of the polity and not as emarginated bigots or unassimilated immigrants. 
Those wise and eloquent words were, of course, written by Judge Guido Calabrese. They were written in 1985, but they are certainly as pertinent, even more pertinent today. Fortunately, there are some laypersons in public life who do model for us how faith and reason can be held together in the secular sphere, and we have two of them here with us tonight, Judge Marta Cartabia, Judge Guido Calabresi. How appropriate that this lecture in honor of Judge Calabresi's life and work should be given by Judge Cartabia, truly dignum et justum est. Thank you. Not to correct Marianne Glenda, but there's three, not two. <laughs> Thank you. Feel free to write cards and pass them over. And uh, just while that, that's happening, uh, I'll just begin the conversation uh, with an observation. When I read papal documents, I read them in this, with the eye of what's there and what's not there. For example, in Gaudium et Spes, I can be ex uh, inspired by what's there. But you see what's not there. For example, mention of capital punishment. And so I'm wondering. Uh, Judge Cartavia, when you think of the writings of Benedict the Sixteenth, what greater emphasis might you have hoped for, given the fact he's not a legal scholar, and one suspects Pope Francis is not a legal scholar? Looking back, what might you have hoped he would emphasize more? And looking ahead, what might you hope for, for from Pope Francis? The first part of your question, I really cannot uh, give an answer because uh, it said so much uh, about our legal problems that I did even expect uh, to, to find uh, that a pope could uh, be so pertinent to our, uh, our problems because, you know, if he had chosen another approach, like, uh, for example, listing the major problem of our time, uh, economic crisis, uh, the social state, uh, the welfare system, um, rather than, as I mentioned, uh, the major challenges to uh, public morality, um, he would have given probably some good answer to some of the problems, but he gave us much more than that. Because uh, he gave us uh, the method, the possibility, as lay people, to face almost everything. Because he was correcting so much our understanding of, of the importance of faith in, uh, in the public life and in the legal political issues. Uh, that I think that we are ready to, to face with this correction any kind of topic, uh, even the most technical one, as I mentioned over dinner, a uh, federalist topic uh, rather than the problem of the relationship between the judiciary and politicians in Italy, which is very important of the new problem of corruption that are coming over and over in Europe. But, I mean, speaking about this fact of uh, reason open uh, to listen to reality and to be corrected by nature, I think that it is uh, what we really need uh, from that. And uh, I would not be surprised uh, if somebody else uh, in a few years will be here to say a similar lecture about uh, Pope Francis, because although apparently he is even a legal, le less a legal scholar than Pope Benedict XVI, in fact, uh, Reading through his uh, speeches uh, as an archbishop, uh, we can find uh, so many suggestions uh, useful for our work uh, that uh, uh, can probably become very, very soon uh, another material for another lecture. Thank you very much. <laughs> So you draw a distinction, or rather, uh, Pope Benedict drew a distinction between the normal sphere of democratic politics, which can be relativistic and, and under the majority, and the few issues of fundamental law that cannot be. Uh, but of course, one of the great 
just areas to put the line between the two of them is. And so, for, for example, in the US, um, aggressive Catholics are more likely to insist there are fundamental issues at stake in economic policy. Conservatives are more likely to insist that there are issues more for democratic liberation. And you can say some of the things about abortion and other issues. And um, to complicate issues further, you know, each side of the debate will also posit maybe a different argument about what the role of revealed faith is. So, for example, in abortion, conservative Catholics will tend to say um, Catholic piety has a greater role in declaring what is you know, a matter of, of fundamental right or not. Uh, and the same thing for Imam on the progressive side. And so I'm wondering if Benedict the 16th's uh, his legal writings, legal thinking, offers any guidance on how to resolve both the line between fundamental issues and democratic issues, and also uh, the line between where we really should uh, yield to, to or be more, be more open to pronouncements from a hierarchy about pronouncing what is a fundamental issue, uh, and where even the existence of a fundamental issue is a matter for um, the democratic liberation of the world. Well, I, I'm not sure that uh, uh, when when he speaks about uh, two necessary components uh, uh, of political life, uh, the democratic rule, majority rule, and uh, also the, necessi the necessity of uh, um, always reviewing the legislation in place in order to make sure that it does not become a legal injustice, uh, as we mentioned, uh, he is uh, referring to two different spheres. Uh, you have used it properly in image, uh, saying there are ordinary stuff and then fundamental issues. Well, I'm not sure that uh, his uh, uh, thinking brings us uh, into this uh, division of competence uh, between uh, the majority rule and uh, uh, the more important principle that cannot be dealt with by the majority. It is instead, in my view, uh, He's, he's in a way, he's summoning uh, every m citizen, but also in particular every person who has a public responsibility to always uh, survey the legislation he is <coughs> dealing with. Uh, for example, Judge Calabresi was giving me a wonderful example uh, when uh, he spoke about. William, uh, the, the president, uh, the first woman admitted to Yale, the, the, the dean, uh, well, th this case of this man who decided to, uh, to admit one, the first woman at the law school. And uh, he was obliged to say, uh, to, a, to obey to a rule that says you have to strike her name out of the list and to give her um, her money back. And so, eventually, he did this. Uh, he strike her name out of the list and uh, give her her money back, but let them uh, go to the law school because the rule <laughs> did not imply the fact that uh, she was not admitted to the classes. <laughs> so I think that this is the kind of wonderful example. He was not breaching the law because he was obeying the, re the regulation that was saying that you have to strike her name out but still, justice was pushing him towards the need of adjusting the rule because it was so clear, it was a clear injustice not to have women studying in this law school that this was the new interpretation of the law admitted. This is something similar to Portia in the uh, comedy of uh, the Merchant of Venice. So I, I, I think that we have to come out of this mindset that there are important things and ordinary things. Uh, we, 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 we don't know really when uh, things become important and when they do deserve uh, our correction uh, taken from our conscience uh, to try to find out the way not to impose uh, injustice uh, by law uh, through our acts. Okay? And uh, as to the importance of economic and uh, let's say ethical uh, issues, I think that in the uh, thinking of Benedict XVI, you find everything because you have the first encyclicals about uh, uh, Deus Caritas Est, uh, and uh, you know it is all about uh, charity, and uh, in, a, in a way is pushing uh, towards uh, social issues, and you always uh, also 
uh, other statement concerning life uh, and especially freedom of religion. This is an important point uh, on which he has insisted a lot on. Okay. Thank you. The rest of these questions were brought in from the audience. Based on objective reason, not religion, is gay marriage something that should be supported or opposed, and why? This is a point that I cannot answer because it's one of the things that can come uh, in front of the court uh, and uh, indeed uh, I cannot answer speaking my voice uh, but I cannot even answer speaking the voice of Pope Benedict XVI. I'm very sorry about that but uh, uh, as a judge of the Italian Constitutional Court I have some limitation on this kind of points. Uh, sorry. Where does virtue play a role That's very interesting, but this is a topic for Marianne. Virtues, <laughs> it's her topic. I can just say a, a few words. Um, it is right that modern constitutionalism uh, does not know the word virtue. And uh, insisting only on the idea of individual rights, uh, in a way we have... Uh, mm, overlooked the importance uh, of virtues uh, as uh, an instrument also to build up uh, a better society. But uh, on the other hand, uh, I don't think that uh, there is anything uh, in modern constitutionalism that prevent us to practice our virtues. We have, uh, as Marianne Glendon says, uh, what Benedict XVI says is, first of all, a challenge to the faithful. And I think that in this context, we can find our place and our way to, uh, to recover the importance of virtues, first of all, in our personal life and maybe also in the public sphere. I don't know. Do, would you like to add something about this? Just one thing. Yes, please. Uh, which is, uh, if you go back and read the Federalist Papers, which is to be commended for everybody, Madison, Hamilton, and Jay say over and over again that our democratic experiment depends on citizens and statespersons with a higher degree of virtue than any other form of government. And then speaking of the judiciary, I think it is in Federalist 78, Hamilton says, the qualities in a judge, they will be rare, but they are intelligence and integrity. So I think we have it in our constitutional tradition. And uh, I think you're quite right in the way you speak of, I mean, putting the responsibility back onto the laity to take these principles and bring them to life. Yeah. Yeah. I think here, yeah, maybe you have No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Don't leave me alone. <laughs> this next question is also directed at both of our speakers for the evening. In a Catholic university such as this one, uh, or Catholic. Uh, is Catholic this a Catholic university? university? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how, would, how would you, as Catholic intellectuals, advise students to prepare themselves for a life as engaged? Catholics. What do we need to know and how should we prepare ourselves? Um, I would say two things and then Marianne could add many others because these are really very tough questions, all of them. Uh, in my personal experience I would say first of all discover what is really faith in my life because Bringing faith uh, in the public sphere cannot be the result uh, of a plan of, of a program. Either it's something really rooted in your personal life or best, uh, better, your life 
is based really the treasure of your life uh, is faith. Uh, otherwise, it's, import it's almost impossible that it can resist in places <laughs> where everything goes in a different direction. Okay? So the first thing I would say is to live uh, uh, a true experience of faith uh, as something uh, fundamental of your own personal life. Then the, all the rest are consequences. Uh, you will find out the way how uh, it changed over time, so the relationship with people, uh, your mindset, uh, your culture, and whatever. But always, uh, always speaking about from my personal experience, I, w I would like to add one important thing, to look at witnesses. That's why it was not formal for me this m at the beginning of this conference uh, to thank uh, Guido Calabresi and Marianne Glendon because they really play an important and inspiring role in my life. Uh, they gave me, and in fact I have also, I have to add another person to this list uh, who is not Catholic at all, but uh, he's Joseph Weiler. He was one of the person who was so convinced of the importance uh, of my own Catholic identity, his Jew, in, in public life, uh, that it was the <coughs> first person to push me to come out to publicly with my personal identity, my religious identity. So these witnesses uh, are so important in my life uh, that uh, they play a role, uh, even if maybe uh, I have a contact with them maybe once or twice per year, but uh, still uh, the important, they, they, they are part of myself. There is a we in, in my eye <laughs> that I bring always with myself. So the first two things that I would say is uh, not a special program about uh, Catholic culture or whatever, but uh, living a true experience of faith and looking at, look the, looking at witnesses that really you can see live the, something that you would like to become like them. Okay? No, no, please. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Nothing to add. This next question is somewhat related. As a Christian, how does one be an active contributor to the democratic process when Catholicism is seen by many as anti-intellectual Unless it is difficult to speak out of the Christian worldview. That was the reason why I chose this topic for tonight, because uh, in my view, uh, we have to discover a new, new face of Catholicism. Because uh, exactly as uh, Marianne said, that uh, uh, we have discovered uh, Benedict XVI, which is so different from the stereotype. Sometimes uh, I think that also we Catholic are uh, trapped uh, into the stereotype of uh, the Catholic Church. Uh, we have much more than that to, to discover, but it's up to us uh, to rediscover the richness and the possibility. And I think that this insistence of Pope Benedict XVI on reason uh, as the fundamental alive of faith, he said in a, in a given moment, he said faith without reason is not human. Sometimes uh, my impression is that we have to dis rediscover the human side of our faith and our religion. And this thing, I think that is something for us to do in first person, not to, to explain to others, uh, but we have to rediscover this uh, side of uh, our experience uh, for ourselves. refers to nature, what is nature and what is natural? Is this determined by reason or by revelation? And if by reason, uh, then must not what is natural be debated? Well, <laughs> this is another very tough question. Um, but here, uh, I, I'm not able to, to give a full-fledged answer. I would like just to mention one book that uh, I come to read, uh, and it is, it is from uh, mm, 
uh, an important uh, philosopher of law of uh, NYU, Thomas Nagel. I don't know if you had the chance uh, to read The Mind and the Cosmos. It's a small book, 2012. Uh, he proclaims uh, that uh, he is not religious and uh, is a sort of he has a sort of allergy uh, when, <laughs> when he feels about. Uh, I understand people speaking about religion or the you know. Uh, the problem uh, of the evolution uh, and the intelligent design and so on and so forth. But uh, in this book uh, he says uh, that we have to rediscover uh, nature and the, the world and he says that uh, uh, the scientific and materialistic reductionism of nature is not able to explain uh, our experience. And this start in a wonderful page. He says, that the simple fact that uh, I am there with my consciousness, my capacity of, in, of understanding the world, says that we are not made just by uh, the element, the chemical and physical element. So the explanation of the world uh, um, that uh, most people accept for the scientific world, starting with the evolutionarism, is not enough. I don't have an alternative, but it is not enough. I don't want to, be, to become you know, a taste lec le reading of the nature and of the world, but uh, I cannot be satisfied with this idea that we are made just by you know, chemical and biological uh, elements. Why I take this example? Because I think that uh, this is the kind of work uh, that we are asked to do. We are not, you know, when, when Benedict XVI speaks about nature and reality, he is not giving us a definition of what is nature, or what is man, what is the world. He's inviting us to be surprised by nature and to be open on it. He speaks about opening the windows. So to me, uh, this fact of uh, putting the attention of an objective nature is an invitation uh, to, to look what is there and not to be sure that we already know. And it is a never-ending task. I, I, I don't think that he's uh, um, giving us the suggestion to come up with a complete definition of what is man, what is nature, what is the world, what is the cosmos. But on the contrary, not to take for granted anything, which is again uh, a sort of uh, warning to our attitude uh, toward knowledge. So it's not a matter, the, this, uh, this idea of nature is not the idea of uh, I have the, defi the Catholic definition of nature, but uh, open your mind to nature. We don't know what it is. It's much, much more than we already know. I don't know if you can understand or if you want to add something, uh, but this is my sense and uh, this book uh, about uh, uh, cosmos and mind and the relationship between the eye and the, the, the world is very, very interesting because it is written by somebody who does not start from the point of view that there is a God who has made everything. Thank you. This is our last question for the evening. Uh, we have a series here of faculty speakers called Life as a Scholar and Believer. What might you say to the book party speakers this evening about your lives as scholars and believers? Scholar and a believer, I, I also think, and I'm sure Marta does. Uh, scholar, believer, wife, mother, grandmother, uh, life is complicated and uh, you, <laughs> you try to keep it all together and there are times when you just have to get down on your benders and ask for some help. <laughs> <laughs> I would like just to, uh, 
to add one sentence about the fact that uh, um, in this messy life, uh, you know, mother, um, spouse, <laughs> and all the rest, uh, there is something that really I'm longing for all the time and to be myself everywhere in any situation, not to have different hats uh, to put on my head. So this uh, uh, longing for a unity mm -hmm. in my life, uh, again, is not something that I can tell you I have achieved the result, uh, but it's something that it is always there as uh, one of the most important uh, drive uh, in my life, in my everyday life. I think you put it beautifully. <laughs> The applause speaks for itself. We thank you both for a very inspiring evening. We're very grateful that you've been here. Uh, before I invite you to the dining hall for refreshments, I'd like to remind you that uh, next Sunday, Cardinal William Levada will deliver the inaugural Reverend Richard R. Russell Lecture, A New Apologetics for New Evangelization, at 7 p.m. Sunday night. And looking ahead, uh, Supreme Court Justice Scalia has been confirmed as the Calabrese Fellow for next year, April 2nd on Wednesday. Please come back. Again, thank you to our guests, and I invite you to meet them in the dining hall next door. Thank you for being here, and good night. Oh, yeah.